James, the first chapter. Praise God. And, uh, where did we stop last week? Anybody remember? Start at verse 9. Okay. Um, why don't somebody read 9 through 12 for us? You know what? Let's go back to verse 5. Somebody read verses 5 through 12 for us because that's a whole section. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed in the same way. The rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Mm -hmm. That just sounds good. Yeah, I want to start at the last verse and we'll work backwards uh, because it talks about blessed. And whenever the Lord talks about blessed, I want to know about it. What is a blessed person, a blessed individual? What does a blessed life look like? He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. What is temptation? Now, I didn't ask you who, who were the temptations. <laughs> I said, what is a temptation? Would it be something fine again? Um, yeah, uh, if you, yeah. well, especially if you say it, you know, yeah, probably yes. Fight against doing what it is that you're tempting to do when you're trying to fight against it. It sounds like something that would take your attention away from what God would have you do, mm -hmm. get you off task. Mm -hmm. Something you um, something you want, but you really don't need it. Mm. Hmm. Something you want, but you really don't need That's good. That's good. All of those were good. Here's the thing about temptation. If you didn't have an appetite for it, it wouldn't be a temptation. No. You can't be tempted by something you don't want. Okay? And... And, and that's why I tell people, don't ever brag about what you don't do. Because the reason you don't do it may be because you don't have an appetite for it. And God doesn't want to know what you don't do. He wants to deal with what you do do. Because <laughs> it's that, it's in those areas that we need God's uh, deliverance. That we need God's guidance. That we need him to order our steps uh, because uh, we all get tempted. Um, songwriter said, yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some others to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passion subdue. Look ever to Jesus and he will carry you through. Temptation starts in the mind. It's a thought. And your mind is a battleground. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So thoughts precede actions. If you want to change a person's actions, you've got to change what they think. And in order to change what they think, you've got to change who's on the throne. Somebody's sitting on the throne. You know, either the Lord is sitting on the throne or... Uh, Satan is sitting on the throne or self is sitting on the throne. One of those three. And of course, if self is sitting on the throne, 
Um, then there's going to be some, well, we all know what, what happens when we go our own way, right? Uh, when we do our own thing, we end up in a bad place. If Satan is on the throne, you're headed for destruction. Because the thief comes to do what? Still kill. And if he don't want to play with you, he wants to kill you. Uh, Christ has come that we might have life and have that more abundantly. So temptation comes to divert us uh, from what God intends for us to do and be. Um, and everybody is tempted. Even though God does not tempt us. Um, praise God. And so we, we, we are blessed when we endure temptation. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if you endure after you are tried, you will receive the crown of life. That's what we all, you know, anticipate. The crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now that word love is a strong word. And uh, I want to take a little time and talk about it because, you know, the love that the world talks about is not the love that God talks about. And so, in order for us to really understand, let me go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the love chapter in the Bible. Um, and let's see what love is, what it, what it does. Um, because uh, when you hear it, you start to appreciate that it's a unique kind of love. So somebody start at the very first, matter of fact, we're going to read the whole chapter because it's not a long chapter. So somebody just start reading at verse 1 and, uh, and read the entire chapter for us. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity flaunted not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoice, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three things, but the greatest of the, these is charity. Now in that translation, charity means love. love right? So if you're reading from uh, a different translation, it would be the word love. love right? um, and so somebody got the, start at verse four and read through verse seven, uh, where it, you have in your translation love. Four through seven, anybody? Love never fails. Love never fails. 
This kind of love that we're talking about is a God kind of love. It is agape love. It is the highest form of love. When you talk about agape love, agape love is a love that goes out in spite of what comes back. Um, it's not predicated on what you do. Um, it is predicated on the one who is uh, exercising the love. And since 1 John says God is love, then he's going to be, he's going to act in loving ways because that's who he is. And so it's no accident that we uh, read in, in uh, Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means that Christ knew that we couldn't get right. He knew that we couldn't get it together. And so he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves while we were sinners. Now if he loved us with a perfect love, you can't improve upon perfection. In other words, God is not going to love you more because you change. Okay? Because when, when, when you're perfect in anything, that means you're complete. And, and the Lord loves you completely. And he loves you perfectly. And, you know, when you ask the question, why does he love you? The answer is because he loves you. And uh, the great love verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. See, love is giving. If you love somebody, you're going to give to that person. Um, and that's not always material things. That's giving in a lot of, in a multiplicity of ways. Right. Hallelujah. I love that word, multiplicity. <laughs> you know, uh, it, is, it, it is showing um, gratitude and, um, you know, going the extra mile uh, because of, of love. So love is not, now when you talk about the world's kind of love, you know, we got two words in the Greek uh, that capture what most people operate in. <coughs> The word eros, is, you get the word erotic from the word eros. It is a sensual kind of love. Um, and a lot of people get infatuated with uh, the way somebody looks. Here's the problem with that. There's always going to be somebody that looks as good or better than you. And you know, I know you're beautiful, but you ain't the only pebble on the beach. <laughs> and if you're just operating in eros, then you may have some difficulties, uh, you know, uh, sticking and staying. Amen. There is another word called phileo. We get the word Philadelphia from it. It is a brotherly kind of love. Hence, the city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Uh, but brotherly love is uh, shaky. You know, uh, it wasn't long, leave chapter 5 of Genesis, where a brother rose up and killed his other brother. Cain slew Abel. Mm -hmm. Right? Because he was mad at God. Mm -hmm. He couldn't fight God, so he struck his brother. Mm -hmm. So, and from that time forward, we see uh, tension in families, sibling rivalry. Um, as a matter of fact, even in, in Jewish homes, from that time forward, you see a flip-flop in the family where the oldest boy, who's supposed to be the prominent boy, is not. But some other boy takes the, the area of prominence. You, know, you talk about, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Abraham. Abraham, you know, he had Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac is the son of promise, even though he was the, the, the one born second. Right? Uh, Isaac has boys. You know, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the oldest boy. Jacob was the son that received the promise. 
uh, when you look talk about Jacob, Jacob had 12 boys. The oldest boy, Reuben, was not the, the prominent son. Uh, it's going to be the fourth born son, Judah. Why Judah? Because Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Even though Joseph carries the narrative uh, in the book of Genesis from chapter 37 all the way to chapter 50. Uh, but Judah is the prominent son. Even when you get to the book of Luke, chapter 15, it is not the oldest boy that goes to his dad and asks for the things that come to him. It's the youngest boy who goes out and, and spends his substance in riotous living. Um, you know, runaway child running wild. <laughs> you know, lost in this great big city. You better go back home where you belong. Not one familiar place. Ain't it a pity? <laughs> Go back home where you belong. This boy ends up in a pig pen, wanting to eat what the pigs eat. You know, a Jewish boy ending up in a pig pen, that's bad enough. <laughs> the Bible says that when he came to himself, he said, how many of my servants, my father's servants, have food enough and to spare? And I'm down here wasting away, perishing because of lack of food. He said, I'm going to get up from here and I'm going to go back home. And I'm going to tell Dad, you don't even have to treat me like a son. Just treat me like the hired servant. And the Bible says when he was not far from the house, that his father ran down and hugged him and said, kill the fatted calf. For this, my son, was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. So you see a flip-flop in the family because of uh, brothers falling out mm -hmm. with one another. You know, uh, and so, praise God, um, eros is a worldly kind of love. Phileo is a worldly kind of love. Agape is a godly kind of love. And in order for us to, to love God in the manner we're supposed to, God has to give his love to us so that we can love through his love back to him. Because we don't have the capacity to love like God loves. You know, that's the reason why when, uh, when he met Peter on the Sea of Galilee after his resurrection, you know, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus was saying, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter was saying, Lord, I phileo thee. He says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my lamb. Peter, do you love me? By this time, you know, Peter, he's hot here. He's just, Peter was one of them kind of, he was flamboyant. You know, he just, <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Lord, I love you. I phileo you. And the Lord said, feed my sheep. We cannot love with a God love unless God gives us his love to love through. Now, this is very important. Why I'm spending a lot of time on this love thing is because you cannot forgive people if you're not operating in God's love. You know, you hear people saying, you know, she made me feel some kind of way, so I, I can't, I, I ain't feeling it. You know, and some people will not forgive because their feelings direct how they operate. I tell people, you do what God says. Make the decision to forgive and then allow your feelings to catch up with your decision. Because if you try to wait for your decision to catch up with your feelings, you may never forgive anybody. What if you prayed and said, God, I need your forgiveness. And God said, you know what? I ain't feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> what if God said, you know, let me pray on that. How would you feel? Not too good. So if we don't want God treating us in that manner, then we shouldn't treat 
others in that manner. But the only way you can forgive and the only way that you can love and the way God intends for us you to love is to allow his love to love through you and not lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So love, it's an agape love. It is a love that goes out in spite of what comes back. Any questions about the love? Because that's, this is very important. So I started at the end because it, it's the main piece that we need to, to get. <laughs> yeah, well, well, see, here's the thing about the, the son. The first two things, and by the way, it's, uh, it's called the lost and found chapter. Because okay. two things were lost before the son was lost. Remember, there was a sheep that was lost. And the shepherd left the 90 and 9 and went out and found the one lost sheep. Brought it back into the fold. And the Lord said there was more rejoicing in heaven over the one who was lost and found than the 99 that needed no salvation. Then a woman lost a coin in her house. And you know, back then they had dirt floors, so if you dropped a coin on the ground, it could be covered by dirt or dust. And so the Bible says she swept diligently until she found the lost coin. When she found the lost coin, she called the neighbors together so that they could celebrate that she had found the coin. Well, the coin is an inanimate object. It didn't get lost by itself. She had to lose it. When that boy left home, he has memory. He has conscience. And so when he got low in life, he remembered his father's house. And memory is a strong thing. Because memory will let you know you're living beneath your privilege. You better get up out of here and go on back to the crib. You know, how many, how many kids grow up saying, you know, I, man, I, I'll be glad when I get grown. You know, I don't have to abide by nobody's rules and they can't tell me what to do. And you be gung ho trying to get out. <laughs> then when life hits you in the face, <laughs> you be you look back and you say, "Good to God that I had stayed home <laughs> a little bit longer. Yes, yeah. I could have so could have could have saved up a little bit more money, and you know I could have put up with what was going on. You know that it wasn't so hard now that I'm now that it's hitting me, <laughs> right? Now that the rent." I got to pay for food. You know, I got to pay for food. I got to pay for cars. And I got to pay for all these things. Because as somebody told me, it costs to be the boss. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so um, life will teach you some things. And, you know, uh, sometimes people have to experience loss before they can be found. Now it's bad to have to experience everything in life. You know, there ought to be some, some things you ought to learn from looking at other people. Right. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the mouse in the mouse trap. Well, you know, uh, animals are instinctual. And so they, they're not rational. You know, they can't look and see a thing go down and say, you know what? If I do the same thing, that thing will happen to me like that. That's why mouse traps work. You know, if you take Pixie out, <laughs> re reset it, rebait it, Dixie coming to it, you get a bowl. But humans are not just instinctual, we are rational. So we have the ability to look at a situation, assess and evaluate it, and come up with a better scenario mm -hmm. than getting caught like somebody else. You shouldn't have to get burnt all the time. Right. 
to know a thing that's hot. You know, I like to use the analogy, you know, you talk to a little kid and you tell them don't touch that stove, it's hot. And he's just smiling at you, and, you know, and, and as soon as you turn your head, they start reaching for it. But if they ever get burned, you'll never have to tell them again. They'll tell you, hi. So to play off of that analogy and to talk about, to go back to love and forgiveness. Tone as flesh is so hard to forgive. Mm -hmm. Forgive someone that you love. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in that agape love, but in that fellow love mm -hmm. that you're so afraid that they're going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And like you were talking about, it's so funny that you said that it was about like the brothers and who were the promised ones. And I always felt that in my family, my dad was like the chosen son. Mm -hmm. um, and his oldest brother, you know, they just, I'm not gonna say too far as like this Cain and Abel, but mm -hmm. like verbally mm -hmm. it's like Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to see, like for me to see my parent and my uncle viewed in that manner. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, I still love my uncle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I can love yeah. you. Because yeah. like, it's yeah. kind of really hard to forgive your behavior. Yeah. And I mean, do you just love and forgive from a distance? Or do you really should, is it godly of us to really speak that and just say, I love and I forgive you? Mm -hmm. if you and then move on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, you ought to be led by the Spirit. Okay. So even in forgiveness, there are times when, you know, you you have to treat some people as they used to tell us with a long-handled spoon. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. you know, so you keep some people at a distance. That's not because you don't love them. Right. That's just, you know, wisdom. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, yeah, he's you know, you know, I'm gonna love you, but I'm gonna love you from afar. <laughs> You know, <laughs> uh, you know. So, the, but the Holy Spirit will direct you as to when to move, how to move, what to say, when to say it. Our problem is that many times we don't listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, we go our own way, and when things mess up, then we come back to God and say, "God, I need your direct." God say, "I wanted to direct you in the first place." <laughs> You know, but you, you didn't have time to stop and listen because sometimes you can be right wrong. You can say the right thing at the wrong time. You can make a right move at the wrong time. You know, there's timing is everything. Um, sometimes people um, will ask you a question that you don't need to answer. If you just pause, you know, the Holy Spirit will say, don't answer that. And pretty soon, the person will say, okay, I know the answer. They answer their own question. Rather than you get in a protracted conversation about, you know, and have you all bothered, hot and bothered about something that could be answered, you know, if a person just have a little time to think about it. Uh -huh. I have a relative, and one of my relatives passed away in January, and they got really, really upset because they couldn't read the obituary. Mm -hmm. And so they wrote us all these mean texts and all this kind of <laughs> stuff, and you know what I'm saying, just mean, just because you can't read a obituary, come on now. And so one Sunday, after the end of January, they finally text us again and said, I'm sorry for the way I behave, but listen to this. I'm sorry for the way I behave and my tone of voice and this and this and this. And then they wrote us another text to say, correction. I'm not sorry for what I said. I'm just sorry for my tone of voice. And how do you love a person like that? <laughs> and then and, and another thing too, the person came to my job on Monday. I was at work. And I'm bringing out customers, and I just happen to look up and see this person at my job. And they're going to say, did you get my text? I was like, yeah. And they're going to say, okay, and just walked out the door. 
How do you love a person like that? It didn't say it was easy. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says agree with your adversary quickly. Sometimes you agree with people not because you're wrong, but because it takes two to tangle. Right. And if you ain't tangling, there ain't gonna be no struggle. It's kind of like an argument. It takes two to argue. Because right? mm -hmm. my brother was gonna send him a text. I said, no. If you text, just say, I love you. That's yeah. it. I yeah. said, don't even get started with this stuff again. Yeah. No. no. Or if you have your obituary, text it to him. Say, you know, here's your obituary. I'm sorry that you, know, you, were, you were not able to, to, to see it. Here it is. You know, and God loves you and I do too. You know, and I'm praying that, you know, this will, will be the end, the conclusion of this scenario so that we can get on with our lives. You see, you've got to kill people with kindness. You know, you, if you just... Be kind. Yeah. Um, a lot of things will uh, subside. We get in self and we want to retaliate. And I'm not saying you in this situation, but sometimes we want to retaliate. And, and, and the retaliation can come sometime in tone, in body language. You know, it's not all what you say is how you, you know, contort your body when you're around that person. That let's speaks louder than words, you know. So we've got to be uh, allow God to have us in character, so that we don't allow things to impede our progress. And you know, it's kind of like I love the family in, in uh, Cleveland uh, whose dad got killed on the street of Cleveland, and they came on television. They said, you know, we forgive the person who took our father. And, and, you know, people were wondering, how could you forgive this person? You haven't even met them. And their answer was, our father taught us to forgive. And so they were practicing what they had been taught. Is that it didn't take the pain away. And it certainly didn't take the loss away. But we don't carry the weight of unforgiveness. I thought that was absolutely marvelous, the way they handled that, because they diffused a lot of anxiety and tension and stress that can overcome you if you, if you allow that stuff to, to uh, fester. Uh, so we don't need to be weighted down with a lot of excess baggage. So as much as we can, uh, you know, unpack and give to the Lord and allow Him to do it, the better off we're going to be. Do you know your blood pressure will go up when you are tense mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, frustrated? Your heart beats faster. Uh, so there is a there is a, physiolo a physiological you know shift in you when things are on the edge, and you don't need that. You need to be, uh, have clarity of mind and be led by the Spirit. Anybody else? Life hits all of us. And, you know, we all go through different things. Uh, but God wants to deal effectively in and through us. And if we allow him to, he will give us victories that we never thought we could win. Um, but notice what it said um, about rich folk. This was just before what we just uh, dealt with in verse 12. God is not uh, mad at rich folk. Um, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Money is an inanimate object. If somebody put $100 on this table, it wouldn't move unless one of us got 
curious. <laughs> you know, it would just be sitting there. That's because money is just paper or it's just coins. We attribute value to that paper or those coins. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And so a lot of rich people, instead of positing their trust and faith in God, they believe in that almighty dollar. And you can't, you can't follow love, uh, money, and God. You gotta follow one or the other. Because where your heart is, there your treasure is also. And here's, here's what I know. Everything we have belongs to God. Not some things. Everything we have belongs to God. If you don't believe that, one of these days, everything you got, somebody else going to have. The house you live in, you in, the, you in that house temporarily. The car, you, if that car don't you know, diminish, uh, depreciate to the extent that can't nobody drive it, somebody else will be driving it. Everything that you own and have, one of these, you just, it, it's loaned to you. And God loans things to you to see how you're going to handle it. Because if you don't, if you mishandle what God has blessed you with, God will allow things to happen to where you lose the thing that you think you got. You think you got holes in your pocket. You know, He will just allow things to happen to remind you that you can't make this journey by yourself. Um, and so, you know, we need to be. I tell God, whatever I have, you can have it. Because whatever God uh, requires of me, he's going to more than give it back. Because none of us can be God given, no matter how we try. And so, you know, uh, don't get stingy with God. And don't be trying to shortchange God. Because God ain't the one, you know. And then, here's the other thing, I shared this in the noon class, I'll share it with you. You're not in a bargaining position with God. Don't bargain with God. Don't tell, you know, people in the hospital, you know, if you raise me up, you know what, I will serve you. Listen, you need to serve the Lord whether you get up or not. You know, because, you know, God already know if you're lying or not. Because some people get up and go back to doing what they was doing before. <laughs> you know? And, and actually are worse than, than, than before they were sick. So it, don't bargain with God. You, we, we need to trust God and obey God because he is God. And allow God to order our steps in his word. That's the secret to living a blessed and victorious life. Blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, Whatsoever you do, it shall prosper. That's kind of like we do. But if you start trusting in riches, God will allow them to go away. Remember that rich man that uh, looked out on his fields and said, you know, I, my barns ain't big enough. I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'm going to take ease. I'm going to just lay back and say, so take your rest. And the Lord said, fool, tonight your life is required of you. And who shall these things be? You can work all your life and amass a, a, a wealth of stuff and die and leave it to somebody and spend it in one month. You know, um, so you don't want to live like that. You don't want to 
live like that. You want to live in such a way that God will give you more because you, you know how to appreciate and, and deal with what he's given you. I tell people, stop complaining about what you don't have. Start thanking God for what you do have. Because we are all blessed. And we are all wonderfully blessed. Amen. You know, sometimes I ain't got two nickels to rub together, but I'm blessed. Uh, so, um, anybody got anything about that? Because there were rich people that followed Jesus. You know, Joseph of Arimathea was rich. You all know who he was, right? Joseph of Arimathea? Who was he? He's the guy. Yeah, he gave Jesus his grave. And you know, Jesus borrowed the grave because he wasn't going to need it long. Well, it was Joseph of Arimathea that went to Pilate to beg the body of Jesus. So you know he had to be a man of means to be able to put him in his tomb. So he was a rich man. There were other rich people who followed Jesus. Even Zacchaeus well, was, a, was a, a tax collector. And he had, he, he had done scammed a lot of folk. He was a short man in stature, so he had to go up a tree in order to see Jesus. And Jesus said, come down, because I'm going to your house. And when Jesus went home with him, uh, he repented of his sins and gave back three times what he had taken. Because when you see Jesus and Jesus clean you up, you understand that everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. So don't ever get caught up with money. Money is, money is not the end. It's only a means to an end. You know, money comes and money goes. Uh, but God is consistent. God is that consistent person in a person's life. So um, then it talks about a double-minded person. You know, double-minded, always in between thoughts, right? You all see, it says, uh, ask in faith in verse 6, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall have received anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is what? In all his ways. You know. Um, here's what we need to do. We need to agree with God. That means you got to study the word. You got to meditate on the word. You got to do what the word said. And if you agree with the word, the word will direct you. The word will guide you. And you don't need to be wondering about the word. You don't need to be guessing. Because, see, the devil wants to get you to doubt. Now, if you doubt, then you're going to be in between thoughts. Well, one day if I ought to do this or I ought to do that or anything. No, God... You give me wisdom in how I should act and how I should respond. And I'm not going to move until you show me. And when you live like that, God, listen, God knows the things that he has for you. The plans he has for you. Uh, he will prosper you and he'll give you hope and he'll give you a future. But you got to follow him. And don't Lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will make your path straight. So the antidote for being double-minded is to trust in God's word. 
and be obedient to God's word. That's why I love our theme. You know, pray and let the word do the work. Sure. You gotta pray. Much prayer, much power, little prayer, no prayer. And you pray, and the Lord will kick in motion. And he'll he'll make things happen for you that money can't even happen for you. I've seen in the South, people do very well without any monetary exchange. Matter of fact, there used to be a time when just on the word of somebody, transactions were made. You know, just, just, just the, the word, because a person had such a reputation. You could be a child of somebody, had a great reputation, they'll say, I don't know you, but I know you can folk. I'm going to do this for you because of them. <laughs> See? That's when you live right. You know, reputation. That's why, you know, uh, I, was, I was sharing earlier today that, you know, I don't, when I go to the courthouse, and I don't go and represent people often because I don't want to be compromised. So when I go to the court and I address the court or talk to the lawyer or judge, I want to have such credibility that my words carry weight. So I had the opportunity to go down to the court and I told the lawyer to tell the judge I need to address the court and the judge allowed me to do so. And at, after I got through speaking, the judge said, that he was going to send this person back to jail. He said, but on the strength of what I said, he wasn't going to send him back to jail, he was going to put him in a rehab facility. <laughs> now, that can't happen if you're always being compromised. And if you don't, if you don't live in such a way and present yourself in such a way that people have respect you know, so you've got to guard, you know, your reputation. And don't hang with everybody. Because birds of a feather flock together. You never see geese flying with sparrows. You know, um, and you cannot soar with eagles hanging around turkeys. Yeah, I'm gonna pause. <laughs> if there's any questions, <laughs> comments about any of that. <laughs> Anybody got anything? Love will conquer hate. Yep. Uh, Dr. King used to say that often. And love will conquer hate. <coughs> love is so strong. Love is, is not weak. Love is strong. And sometimes when you love, you're vulnerable. And some people, because of being hurt in the past, they stop loving. Can't stop loving. Yes, it puts you in a vulnerable position, but it is better to love than to have never loved at all. I heard that from somebody. Mm. It sounded just that is <laughs> it <is> flowing right <laughs> into it. Uh, you know, it's it, there are some things that you will never experience until you have the ability to love. have a love for God, God will open up doors, I'm telling you, that you just never could even imagine. He'll do that for you. And he'll surround you with people who will help you to get where you're going. He'll do that. 
He'll open doors that can't nobody close. He'll close doors that can't nobody open. And he'll, he'll, he'll bless you out of your size. Anybody got anything? Y'all, I'm going to cry. Are y'all still with me? Yes. <laughs> So this is the book of James, and, and James is a very practical book. It's one of the things, if you really want to know about practical living, day-to-day -day living, this is a good <coughs> book to be in. That's why we're studying it. Um, and, and, you know, we're not trying to rush through the book of James. You know, we're taking this first chapter and just kind of, you know, going at a pace. Because here's the thing. You, we want to get an understanding. Sometimes when you read the Bible... You've got to stop and, and look at words because words in one context may not be the same word in another context. So you talk about the word love in English, it's L-O-V-E. Yep. But there are different types of love that if you don't do the research, you will misappropriate what is being said. You know, you didn't know, for instance, that, that that scenario between Peter and Jesus, you know, they both use the word love, but they're talking about two different kinds of love. And if you don't know that, you you start to wonder, why are he asking him, you know, <laughs> he asking him the same question, right? And you think Peter was on good terms, you know, by saying, no, you know, Lord, now wait a minute, now you done asked me that two times now. I done told you I love you. Right? Well, see what, and, and then what the Lord was doing was he was restoring Peter. Because remember now, the same steps you go away from God are the steps you got to come back to him. Jesus said, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice. And so they asked him, said, Peter, you knew him. No. Peter, I saw you with him. No, it wasn't me. Peter, even your speech betrays you. He said, no, you got the wrong man, and the cock crowed. And Jesus' eyes fell on Peter. And Peter ran away sorrowful. Because he never thought that he would have denied the Lord. And so what Jesus is doing is he's restoring Peter. He went three steps away from the Lord. Now the Lord is allowing him to come three steps back. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? So. And once he's restored, on the day of Pentecost, Peter is going to be the main preacher. And based upon the sermon that he gave, 3,000 souls would be added to this new institution called the church. But that could not have happened unless God, through Jesus, had restored Peter. Sometimes we have to be restored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you know, we, we get out the box sometimes. Mm -hmm. We've got to come back. And so the Lord, was, he loves us so much until he will allow us to come back and, and give us a new start. And, you know, Every day you wake up is a new start. It's a new beginning. New possibilities. I tell people, when you wake up, don't say you're having a bad day or this is a, there's no bad days. Okay. You may have some, some negative circumstances that you have to be in the day. But every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Every day is a day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. There's no bad day. You don't get up on the wrong side of the bed. If you got up, it was the right side. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we need to stop talking negatively and appreciate the goodness of God. You know, you all here tonight. All y'all got your the use and activity of your limbs. You you in a reasonable portion of health and strength. You can. You can hear me talking, you're responding. We are blessed. Mm -hmm. oh, and we need to thank God.
for the opportunity to be present. Thank you. Yes. Because I go to work and you ask people how they're doing at my job and they be like, I'm here. And you're like, oh, is that all you fit feel about yourself? So I'm here. I'm like, oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know, and they label every day. Yeah. I'm every here. day. I'm like, oh, you know, oh, Monday, oh, it's, yeah. it's a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wednesday is what? Oh, oh, day. You know, Thursday they be preparing for Friday. <laughs> Even back when I was little, they said the eagles fly on Friday. But <laughs> no eagles fly, there's a whole bunch of buzzards fly. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah. And getting out there messing up. You know, and, and, and it'd be so so jacked up until the whole rest of the, the month would be messed up because folk be done spent all of their money, hard-earned money, in two days. Mm -hmm. Go out and talk about they having a good time and, the, and their best friend is the commode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything make you hug a commode, that, that, that can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> well, praise God. I, you know, it is what it is. You know, we've, we've got to, uh, we've got to see life as it is. But thanks be to God that He keeps on blessing us and giving us another chance. Amen? Amen. So next week we will start up at verse 13 and go a little bit further. Praise God. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, our study in the book of James because I think we're going to see a lot of things that as we go forward uh, that's going to enhance our walk with God. Amen? Amen. All right. Anybody have any